Okay, hi guys, welcome back to um, the WashU Nephrology web episodes. We're coming back with a new format here, which is going to be board review uh, for all of you second year fellows who are graduating and are getting ready to take your board certification. Good luck. Uh, one of the things that comes up a lot on the in training exam and on the boards is uh, potassium disorders. So I've chosen a couple questions which have been taken from NEFSAPs in the past, which I think uh, demonstrates some nice potassium disorders. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined by one of our first year fellows, Dr. Adris. So thank you for being here, Fahad. Thank you. Um, so before we start, I just want to quickly thank our sponsors, which would be um, the AGKD blog, Nephron Power blog, and the Renal Fellow Network blog, great resources for fellows. And also be sure to check out NEFJC, which is the online nephrology Journal Club. And so with that, we are going to get started. Uh, I'm going to read the questions out loud and then I'm going to ask Fahad what he thinks. Um, so in full disclosure, we have already gone through these questions in our board review at our conference last week, so we'll see how well Dr. Idris uh, remembered them. The first question here, both Barter's and Gittleman syndrome present clinically with hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis, and normal or low blood pressure. Which of the following studies can be useful to differentiate between the two disorders? So you have a TTKG, 24-hour urine calcium excretion, fractional excretion of magnesium, urine chloride, or urine sodium. So, Fahad, tell us what you think. Um, so, uh, I think the correct answer is uh, uh, B, a 24-hour uh, urinary calcium excretion. Uh, but So, the transtubular potassium gradient will be elevated in both of them, mm -hmm. uh, so we can differentiate between that. Uh, uh, fractional excretion of magnesium um, might be low as well uh, in both. Uh, urine chloride and urine sodium is uh, elevated in both. The 24-hour urine uh, excretion will be um, uh, el uh, the, the uh, elevated in uh, Barter syndrome mm -hmm. uh, and will be low in Gittelsmann syndrome. Great. Which is like a thyroid. Great. So you're, c you're correct um, in the calcium excretion. I, I'll, I'll make a comment. So the, the both ag disorders actually can lead to hypomagnesemia, so it actually will lead to an elevated fractional excretion of elevated. magnesium. Uh, but you're right, the urine sodium, the chloride can be high in both of these. But really the best way to differentiate these is w by looking at calcium excretion. And even if you just think about, um, you know, how we treat uh, hypercalcemia, it usually involves giving a loop diuretic, which enhances calcium excretion. And if you think about how we treat uh, patients with hypercalciuria in the setting of stones, we oftentimes put them on a thiazide diuretic to lower their calcium excretion. So even if you don't understand the physiology, you hopefully was, were able to understand that both um, um, Barters and Gittleman's, which are like being on a loop diuretic or a thiazide diuretic, lead to different um, uh, calcium issues within the urine. So, excellent. I'm going to um, just show you here kind of what um, a table comparing the two. Barters uh, is like being on a loop diuretic. Uh, Gittleman's like being on a thiazide. Both of them are very rare autosomal recessive. And the defect is in the sodium potassium 2 chloride in the thick ascending loop for Barters and the sodium chloride co-transporter for Gittleman's in the distal tubule. Um, the magnesium can be helpful sometimes, although both of them really can lead to a low magnesium and thus a high fractional excretion of mag. But the urine calcium is elevated in Barter's and low in Gittleman syndrome, which is the differentiating factor. And so just to briefly um, show you how that is the case, I'm going to hopefully use a laser pointer. So this is a picture taken from Burton Rose's uh, Bible on fluid electrolytes. So barters, if you think of it being like a loop diuretic, a loop diuretic would compete f for the chloride in the sodium potassium 2 chloride. So under normal circumstances, when you have reabsorption of sodium potassium 2 chloride, the potassium gets spit back out and the chloride gets reabsorbed on the basal lateral side. So the net result of that is you have a positive uh, charge in the urine and negative charge on the basal lateral membrane. And because of that electrical gradient, positive cations such as calcium and magnesium are reabsorbed paracellularly because of that electrical gradient. So you can imagine if you were to block this, like with a loop diuretic or if you had Barter syndrome, you would no longer have that gradient to drive that paracellular calcium reabsorption and you would end up dumping calcium into the urine. In Gittleman's, which uh, uh, is like being on a thiazide diuretic, here we are in the distal tubule, the sodium chloride tr uh, transporter. 
And it, it, it's a little bit harder to conceptualize. There is a calcium channel here in the, in the distal tubule. And if you were to block the sodium chloride transporter with a thiazide diuretic, or if you had a loss of function of this as a result of Gittleman's, um, you will still actually end up having sodium being driven into this cell on the basolateral membrane in exchange for calcium. And as a result of that exchange of calcium, you have calcium entering into the cell, which is why a thiazide diuretic leads to hypercalcemia and hypocalciuria. So um, let's move on to the next question. So here we are. Aminoglycosides can produce a clinical syndrome that mimics which one of the following tubular disorders? So Gittleman's, Little's, Barter's, pseudohypoaldosterism type 2, and Gordon's syndrome. So, um, by elimination, I guess, um, um, Gettleman syndrome is um, uh, affecting the um, distal tubules, okay. which is like a thiazide diuretic. Um, uh, Liddell uh, syndrome is uh, affecting the inaction, which is also in the distal tubule. Correct. Cortical collecting um, duct. Cortical mm -hmm. collecting duct. The Barter syndrome is in the, um, like a uh, loop diuretic uh, effect, so it's in the thick ascending limb. Okay. Um, uh, and then uh, Gordon and uh, pseudohypoaldosteronism type 2, which is both uh, the same thing. Heck, yeah, good catch. Um, Th good. Uh, which causes hyper uh, tension with hyperkalemia. Um, and so do you know where the defect is in uh, those in Gordon syndrome or PHA type two? So you're a absolutely right that they're the same disease, and so because of that, you can uh, immediately eliminate them. But do you know what the defect um, or what what channel? Um, so the defect is in the wink. Uh huh. So uh, yeah, great. Okay. The molecular defect is in the wink. Um, and what what uh, transporter? I think it it affects also the. Is it? Um, uh, um, it's the opposite of Gittleman, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. So if if you so let's go back real quick. So if you if you think of um, Gittleman's like being on a thiazide diuretic and, and inhibiting this, um, Gordon syndrome or PHA type two is kind of like a gain of function oh, okay. of this. So you end up with sodium and chloride being reabsorbed. You, you, so the phenotype ends up being hypertension, salt retention. And then because of all the sodium being reabsorbed here, you have decreased distal sodium delivery, which results in the hyperkalemia. So that's, that's a good catch. So it's not D or E because that's, those are the same. And then so which one of these A, B, or C does aminoglycosides cause? So uh, aminoglycosides usually affect the proximal tubules. So okay. So it can uh, cause a proximal RTA as yeah. well. So I, I, I would go with uh, barters. So Barter's is right. Okay, so uh, this is kind of a knowledge question, but even if you didn't know um, um, the answer, you could eliminate D and E because they're the same. And, and it's very interesting how aminoglycosides can cause a Barter syndrome because if you recall on the basal lateral side of the thick ascending limb, you also have a calcium sensing receptor. And um, aminoglycosides are polyvalent cations that can actually activate that calcium sensing receptor leading to a Barter's like syndrome. Excellent. Okay. So this next one's one of my favorites um, taken from NEFSAP. It's a, it's a long preface. Uh, so the story is kind of long. I'll read it out. 33 year old African American man with sickle cell disease presents with crisis. Physical exam reveals an anxious man, blood pressure 156 over 94. Pulse of 98, respiration is 22. Their scleral icterus. Lab exam reveals a hemoglobin of 7 reticulocyte count of 12% and a total bilirubin of 38. Chemistries reveal sodium-136, potassium-2.2, chloride-85, bicarbonate-29, and creatinine of 0.6. So urine studies reveal urine sodium-63, potassium-49, chloride-58, and both urinin and aldo levels are low. So here's more history. He's treated with exchange transfusions, potassium supplements, and he's discharged with a total bilirubin of 8, and his potassium returns to normal. Five months later, he returns again in hemolytic crisis, same clinical scenario of hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis. A TTKG done at this time shows a value of 12, which is elevated, and again, low renin and low aldo levels. So the question is, which one of the following is the best explanation for 
the recurrent hypokalemia? Is it little syndrome? Is it intracellular potassium shift? Is it acquired deficiency of 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase 2? It's quite a handful of words. Surreptitious diuretic use or glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism? Um, so, again, little syndrome is the uh, defect in the ENAC uh, channel. Mm -hmm. um, and it usually affects younger um, individuals. And usually it's not going to. Uh, resolve and then come back again. Okay, so, uh, the, the, so the 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 kind of intermittent sporadic nature of this disease argues against, against little, little syndrome. Um, although little syndrome would present with um, hypokalemia and, and hypertension and alkalosis. Okay, all right. Um, the shift of potassium into cells. Uh, what argue is against this is the high TTKG, uh, right. which was uh, uh, checked in the yes, second, uh, right. event. Exactly. Um, Acquired deficiency of uh, 11 beta hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase 2. Uh, this usually uh, is the uh, apparent mineralocorticoid excess. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure what's causing it in this individual, but um, a surreptitious diuretic use uh, that can cause the high TTKG um, and that can cause also. Um, uh, usually it will cause low blood pressure, uh, mm -hmm. but not high blood pressure. But it will also cause a high uh, aldo uh, ratio. Yes, uh, right. Ratio. So the low renin and the low aldo in this in the question stem here argues against that, right? And okay. Then the uh, GRA um, will also uh, cause uh, high uh, hypokalemic, hypertensive, uh, and uh, the aldosterone will should be high. Okay, great. So which so is not in this case. Correct. So, so kind of by elimination, you've C. come to C, which is the right answer. And this is a really tough question. Um, so, so a couple points about this is so you, you, you correctly mentioned that this is the syndrome of apparent mineral corticoid excess. And in this case, um, because of the elevated bilirubin, the elevated bilirubin actually can affect the enzyme. And this is oftentimes, uh, not often, but also seen in, in cases of... Uh, cholestatic jaundice as well, where the elevated bile acids can inhibit the, the enzyme. So I have a schematic here which demonstrates that. So here we are in the cortical collecting duct in the uh, principal cell. Again, let me get my laser over here. So here you have um, the ENAC channel, ROMK channel, and the entire mechanism of this cell is dependent on, on aldosterone activating the mineral corticoid receptor which leads to sodium reabsorption potassium excretion. And so, interestingly, under normal circumstances, cortisol can actually also activate this mineral corticoid receptor. And cortisol happens to be present in, ex in abundance over aldosterone. The reason cortisol does not normally activate this mineral corticoid receptor is because in this cell, you have uh, this enzyme which we just mentioned, 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase. And that enzyme will degrade cortisol to an inactive cortisone. And that inactive cortisone is unable to activate this mineral corticoid receptor. So under uh, states of deficiency, so even if, if you're born with a deficiency or if you develop uh, cholestatic jaundice and that inhibits or the other nice question that nephrologists love to talk about is if you eat something in particular so what can you eat that would inhibit this enzyme do you remember oh uh, the, uh, licorice right licorice. exactly so if you ate like European black lic licorice which has uh, glyceratinic acid that would also inhibit this enzyme so that enzyme is gone and cortisol is no longer degraded to cortisone and so cortisol is present in the cell which then binds to the mineral corticoid receptor and leads to the syndrome of apparent mineral corticoid excess. And so the treatment for this is obviously to try to fix the underlying deficiency or stop eating licorice or whatever it is. But if you are born with this, you can also use spironolactone, which inhibits the mineral corticoid receptor. Great. So I really like that question because it, 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 it's, a, it's a hard question that requires you to have knowledge of the pathophysiology in addition to being able to know that the elevated bilirubin can cause uh, AME. All right. So we're going to do another one. So here, a 19-year-old man is referred for management of refractory hypertension. His brother and father both had similar presentations at a young age. Blood pressure is 180 over 110. 
hypertensive retinopathy is seen on exam. Sodium is 140, potassium is 2.2, chloride 90, bicarbonate 36. So very similar to the last patient, except here your renin is low and your aldo is high, and you're given that a plasma 18-hydroxy cortisol is markedly elevated, and the high-res CT of the admin is negative for adrenal masses. So g given this history, what do you think this patient has, and tell me why? Um, so, um, a young guy with family, his positive family history, uh -huh. hypertensive, um, hypokalemic, and uh, alkalotic, mm -hmm. um, with an elevated renin to aldosterone ratio, uh, suppressed elevated renin. aldo to renin. Uh, sorry, yeah, elevated yeah, right. aldo to sure. renin uh -huh. ratio, uh -huh. uh, suppressed uh, renin and uh, elevated aldo. Okay, um, and then um, markedly elevated 18 hydroxy cortisol uh, uh -huh. as well. Uh, CT was done, which is negative for any adrenal masses. So it, it basically looks like a familial uh, hyper aldo, uh -huh. um, but. Uh, with the elevated 18 hydroxy, so it's most likely type 1, not other types, since there is no adrenal masses. Okay. Um, type 1 what? Um, uh, familial hyper, hyper aldo. aldo okay. So that's, uh, uh, that's GRA. So yeah, glucocorticoid so renal aldosteronism. aldosteronism. Okay, so now that you have that in your head, the question becomes easy. Which one of the following is the most specific treatment of this patient's condition? Is it spironolactone, dexamethasone, amiloride? ACE inhibitors, or calcium channel blockers? So both A and B can be used, actually even C, I think, can be used, mm -hmm. uh, but the most specific is to suppress the ACTH, yes. uh, which is, can be done with the dexamethasone. Excellent, excellent, and that's the whole reason this is called glucocorticoid remediable aldosteronism, is that if you give the patient steroids, the hyperaldosteronism goes away. And so this is another complicated um, physiology to get your head around, um, and I, I've um, showing this to kind of demonstrate how uh, why this is the case. So under under normal circumstances, both aldosterone and cortisol are, are created in the adrenal gland, but in different layers. So aldosterone is secreted from the, the zona glomerulosa under the effect of angiotensin II and also potassium, uh, and then cortisol is secreted from the zona fasciculata under the effect of ACTH. And those uh, genes are very similar, and oftentimes, um, due to unequal pairing and crossover, the promoter and the coding regions for angiotensin and ACTH can get mixed up. And so if you mix up the promoter and the coding region for those, you end up with a hybrid gene, which leads to aldosterone, instead of being secreted in the glomerulosa under the effect of angiotensin II, now is secreted in the zona fasciculata under the effect of ACTH. So you have way too much aldosterone, and angiotensin does nothing to shut it down or activate or inactivate it. And the only way to inactivate the aldosterone or decrease its synthesis is to shut down the production of ACTH. And the way you su shut down ACTH is by giving glucocorticoids, such as dexamethasone. So that's why this is called GRA. Um, and this is the family history also is important because it's an autosomal dominant disease. Great. Um, so those are four questions that I think nicely demonstrate some of the challenges we take. When we take these exams, we get these hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis, hypertension, and they all kind of seem the same. But um, we have to think of them as individual entities and try to understand the physiology and the targeted treatment for what channel is involved. Um, we'll be back with more board review at another time if you guys found this helpful. Um, feel free to uh, email me at, with suggestions, yautt at wustl.edu. You can follow our YouTube channel by just searching for Wash U Nephrology. You can follow me uh, on Twitter at Maximal Change. Uh, we'll be back uh, next month with more of this. And uh, thanks, Fahad, for volunteering.